<laughs> that was just the warm up. That was just the warm up. Okay. Good morning, Carrie. Oh, hello. Uh, How are you? Thank you for having me. Of course. Welcome to A Tech High School. Um, we have um, we have seniors here today, and we also have um, some of our ninth graders. So we've got okay. a mix of students in attendance. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, um, oops, a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I have some um, artwork in the room that I'm in that I can share with you, but I'll describe my professional career. So when I was in grade school and high school, I loved art and I kind of felt like I was heading towards an art career, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And a lot of kids, you know, until they actually get their first job, they really don't know how they're going to make a living as an artist. But I knew that, you know, give me a crayon or a marker or a pencil and I was happy and I'd, I'd go to town with it. And um, my first real art class ever was in 10th grade because I went to a Catholic school where we had the same teacher and the same materials for eight years. And while it was fun, it wasn't like art history and a very serious study. So I didn't, I didn't do like the fancy Saturday classes or anything like that. Which school did you go to for high school? So um, I went to Herrick's High School in New Hyde Park for three years. Okay, that's New York. And then um, my mother remarried, so we moved. Um, Right before my senior year, I did one year at Beth Page High School. Okay, so that's so, cool. You had two high schools in your career. Yeah, but it, I wasn't really that connected to the last one. It was, you know, it was a fun last year, but I was just in and out, and then I went to college. So mom so, made you move for your senior year. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it was kind of like we had to, but it, it worked out fine. I'm teasing yeah. mom. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was totally fine. So, um, so tenth grade. In, yeah, so 10th grade, I took studio art, which is like ninth, ninth grade fundamentals art. Um, and the teacher was just so impressive. And he showed slideshows of art history. He introduced me to like a croquel pen with an inkwell, um, you know, George Seurat and cutting paper and doing all these different things that I hadn't really done before. And I was fascinated by it. And I was so excited about it. And I'd go home and be working on the drawings at home. I remember some of the projects we did, you know, he had us fill a quart milk container with plaster and we sculpted that with like a dull paring knife, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and then the next year I went on to maybe another drawing class and uh, darkroom photography. Okay. So uh, that was fun. And that's very rare to have a chance to do that now. I did it then and I did it when I went to art school. But, um, you know, I really understood why the photographer needs to think of what they're composing and what's the whole purpose of it. And today you can take 300 photos and it really doesn't cost you anything as long as you've paid for the camera or the phone. But then, you know, like everything was a little more precious and should, should have been a little more thought out. Um, so I did that. And then in my senior year, I was lucky the school that I moved to had um, a specialized art program also. So my first two periods were the senior, it was not an AP class, but it was like a senior studio class. And okay. there were only five kids in that class. Oh, wow. And in that class we did, she started us on oil paint and we did stained glass and we did all kinds of things. So my first two periods a day were that. And then my third class was advertising art, which is now called what? graphic design and that was all on paper it was just either with colored tape or um pieces you know like nice rich colored paper and i remember doing things like for pan am which is an airline that doesn't exist anymore and um you know starting to understand marketing and strategies and stuff but it was a great morning to be in high school and that was my senior year my so senior year a period two and three with me and we turned the course into an AP art course. Yeah, and year, might so. as well be, right? Exactly So, right. So while I was there, um, I was thinking I want to go to art school, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how I was going to make a living. And I knew somebody that went to the School of Visual Arts. It was like, uh, you know, a guy in the neighborhood who was older and he was attending um, SVA. So he said, think about that school. It's just the best. So I applied there and I did get in. 
but um, I also wanted to go away to school because I didn't really know that town that well. And I, I would have done anything to live in a dorm. It looked so interesting and fun. So I chose to go to SUNY Cortland upstate. Okay. Because they had a, um, an art major also, but it wasn't the best art major. It was fun to be on campus. And I took a lot of art classes there. You know, I took ceramics and several drawing classes, figure drawing, um, you know, learned to paint better, took design classes, but it wasn't really what I needed to be a professional artist. So while I was at Cortland, I kept thinking about, you know, like, oh, should I have gone to SBA? Mm -hmm. So I finished my bachelor's degree in studio art and at I minored was at Cortland. Okay. And I minored in English, which I'm very glad that I did because I have to do so much writing for my current job. I have done writing for previous jobs. I did a lot of proofreading. So English was a great minor if you have something that you can choose. It was practical and it'll take you into That's any career. Advice. That's great like, advice. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do for a living, you wanna be able to compose a proper email or answer the phone properly. Uh, so, it, and it opens you up to the world a little more also. So that was a, a, um, a good choice <laughs> on my part. So your best um, was at SUNY, totally. Yeah. I mean, at SUNY Cortland, you did the whole thing there? I did my four years and I graduated and in May. And then in September, I began work at, um, as, I mean, I began studying at the School of Visual Arts. So you went right to graduate school? I actually got a second bachelor's degree. Oh, wow. So I, have, I have a BA from SUNY Cortland and then a BFA from SVA in Manhattan. So that's 23rd Street is the main building. And while I was at Cortland, I did two summers of interning for a bank in Manhattan called, um, it was Manufacturers Hanover and Chemical Bank, which has now become JP Morgan Chase through mergers. But if you think of a bank, they design your credit card, they design the brochures that they mail to you, they design the signage, the TV commercials, the t-shirts for um, 5K races, all kinds of things. Um, their websites, they didn't have a website back then, but now they do. So I was part of the marketing team that um, supported Chemical Bank, which is, like I said, now part of um, JP Morgan Chase. So I had an internship there for two years and I honestly didn't love the internship, but it brought me into the world of graphic design and commercial art. They taught me all about printing and they started to teach me how to use a Mac computer because before this, everything was on drafting tables, which sounds like the Middle Ages, but it's true. Um, and then, um, so I did two, two summers of that, commuted, put on nice clothes and got on a train probably at 7.30, 8 o'clock. What was your internship? What was that? What was the internship that it you- It was did? at Chemical Bank. So oh, right, right, right. In, um, in their creative services department. Okay. And then when I graduated from Cortland and I was about to start at the School of Visual Arts, Chemical Bank hired me to work um, full time for two years, but basically doing the same thing. Okay. I didn't have a corner office and a company car. I was, you know, it was like the, an they extension of a, my internship. Did they give you a title like junior graphic designer? Yeah. Production it was artist? Well, yeah. It was probably either junior graphic designer or production artist, something like that. But it was fine. I mean, there were a couple of really exciting moments there. I don't know if anybody knows the artist Leroy Neiman. He he yes. um, is sports. famous for doing sports paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the United Way used to commission him once in a while to do a poster as a fundraiser. So he'd make a painting. They'd print 500 copies of it, and he would sign it, and they'd make a lot of money um, as a fundraiser for the United Way. And a couple of times I was the intern pulling the posters away as he signed them. And I actually got to deliver a poster to his apartment in Manhattan. So I was in his apartment twice. Please tell me that you got a signed work of art. He didn't give me one. Forget I do. You know what I do have though? What? Um, maybe a couple of years after that, I wrote to Leroy and I said, thank you so much. You know, it was so nice meeting you those few times. Um, you might remember me. And he wrote back a letter, Dear Kerry, thank you for writing to me. I do remember you. I really want you to continue your painting. So I have a, a personalized letter that he just wrote to me 
but they didn't give me a poster, which- That's a total bummer. <laughs> we want the signed poster. Clearly, yeah, we want the signed artwork. Yeah, and then I don't know if there's any baseball fans in the room, but- Sports fans, yes. So this is, there's a, a baseball moment from um, 1951, I think, called The Shot Heard Around the World. And it was the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Giants. And it was a famous radio announcement because they didn't really have baseball on TV then. It was always on the radio and kids would listen. And they were playing at Ebbets Field. And the um, Ralph Branca, the pitcher from the Brooklyn Dodgers, threw, it was full count, ninth inning. Um, the, giant, the Dodgers were ahead by one point. He threw a pitch, Bobby Thompson, was not the best batter. He hit a home run, brought himself home and somebody else. And the radio announcer goes, the Giants won the pennant, the Giants won the pennant. And they nicknamed that baseball moment, um, the shot heard around the world because it was, it was like the World Series happening in New York City. And so one day I spent that day with Ralph Branca, Bobby Thompson and Leroy Neiman and me. And the four of us took care of all the poster signings and everything. And then we had lunch and it was just the four of us in the room. And my uncles were so jealous when they heard about that day because they remember hearing about that in real life. That's so cool. like, that was exciting. But then there were other times when I just had to, you know, do a lot of tedious tasks, but that's what happens when you're an intern. You have to put up with things in order to earn your way in. So what do you do now for a living? What is your current profession? So now I work as a high school teacher in Queens. And- um, Art teacher? A high school art teacher, yes. So yeah, so I went um, from that job to a few other different jobs, um, which all had different types of tasks, but they were all graphic design. And I did that for 17 years. I finished my degree at SVA um, and I worked for, after Chemical Bank, I worked for Coopers and Lyburn, which is now PricewaterhouseCoopers in financial. Then I worked for an ad agency called Spear New York, which only advertised books. And I saw my ads like in the New York Times and People Magazine, that was kind of fun. And um, while I was working there, I graduated from art school. So which, let me ask you, what did yeah. you, what was your major when you were at School of Visual Arts? Did they ask I you as a major? Yeah, I majored in graphic design and I concentrated in painting because okay. even though I made a living as a graphic designer, I always really cared more about painting and I still do, painting and drawing basically. Um, but at SVA, that's where I learned, uh, where I met this teacher who taught me portrait drawing and painting and he was just phenomenal. His name What's is name? John Murray. Okay. And he retired and moved to Arizona, mm -hmm. but uh, he was such a fabulous teacher. So, so before you came online, I was showing our students um, some of your work on your website. Mm -hmm. And um, I obviously talked about the different genres. You've got landscape painting, still life painting, and then portraiture. And I was talking to my students about um, the history of portrait painting and okay. asking them, did they know, how did portrait painting come about and why did it come about? Mm -hmm. Can you give us your two cents on that? Like the history of portrait painting and like how it came about and why it started? So, okay, um, that's an interesting question. And I ask my students, why do people do portraits now when you can just take a photograph of somebody? Mm -hmm. And there's an artist named John Singer Sargent. I haven't had his book right here. Okay. I, I brought these books in the room. Oh, so this awesome. is Peter Paul Rubens. This is John Singer Sargent. And this is um, a mixture of different artists. These things were 4.95. Now, mm -hmm. I think, they might be ten dollars but they're not a lot and you can spend weeks drawing these things so there's very good copies this is the dover art series mm -hmm. some of them are very simple now why would you want to i mean i know the answer but i'm going to ask you the question why would you want to copy the work of a master painter or master okay painter? so when I, when I copy these or when any artist copies these types of pictures, you're not trying to steal the work and then um, you know, make prints of them and charge $300 a print saying it's your own work because that's plagiarism. What you're learning is how did the artist handle eyelashes or 
how do you make a nose look like it's projecting? And by practicing with these things, um, you know, like, like, how do you do hair? Are you supposed to do every strand or are you supposed to just generalize it? Like, you know, if you look at her hair. So by looking up close at these things, you really get a sense of how another artist handled it. And then you interpret it your own way. You're never gonna make like a computerized or a mechanical impression the way they did. So, you, you know, your drawing is going to be a little bit off, but you wanna learn, um, you know, uh, what should I focus on? How do I start it? All that stuff. So if to get back to your question about, you know, how to portrait Ask our students that question. If you can rephrase the question, and I'd like to see if one of my students um, can take a stab at answering it. About which, about how artists um, handle drawing something or? The question that you pose to your students about portrait. Oh, okay. So I always ask the students, like, if you can take a really quick picture of something, a photograph of some of someone, why would you bother to sit and study portraiture for years and try to really nail um, the likeness of someone when it could be accomplished with a camera quickly? Yeah, why would you, you guys understand the question? It's a little, it's different from yours. I didn't answer your question. Your pantry, award-winning Goya chickpeas. Let's make a chickpea skillet with chorizo and shrimp. Chickpeas, olive oil, wait, a salad instead? Chickpeas, olive oil, same ingredients. So many possibilities. If it's Goya, it has to be good. You guys heard that commercial, It's April 19, 1775. The sun is rising on the village of Lexington and the first battles of the Revolutionary War are about to begin. Second. 700 British soldiers march into Lexington at daybreak. Right? They're on their way. Okay, there it's off. Did you hear that or did I just hear that? No, we, <laughs> now I'm in the mood for chickpeas. <laughs> that was the, you yeah. know what, I put the link for the um, the shot that was heard around the world from the oh, channel. Well, there's two versions of the shot heard around the world. The first one has to do with, I think, the, um, the Revolutionary War. Okay, well that's And then the happened. second one, the link started yeah. to play in the background. Like history.com. And okay. then the second one was the baseball moment. Okay, so I know. So, so it was like a nickname for that baseball moment. Okay. Okay, so sorry about that. So we were we were saying like, if it's so easy to take a picture, a photograph with a camera or a phone, why do people bother to learn drawing and portrait drawing? Oh, somebody's typing. Tasvia? Tasvia, thank you for answering. She wrote, portraits are fun and you can practice realism skills and shading. And if you just take a picture in a camera, there's no fun in that. Wow, that we should make a t-shirt of that, right? <laughs> or put that on the outside of like a box of pencils, like, <laughs> you know, exactly right. are fun. Um, so thank you um, for that. Your Anyone else um, want to take us add to what Tasvia said and anybody want to take a, a stab at answering that question. Like, why would you bother to draw someone when you can just take a quick picture? How about Daniel? Daniel, are you are you awake and ready to answer a question? Or Aliana? Daniel or Aliana? Are you in the house? <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> they might be my sleeping seniors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, your question reminded me of this artist, John Singer Sargent, who, and if anybody doesn't know this work, he does phenomenal portraits in pencil and in oil paint, but he also has a lot of landscapes. He lived all over Europe. So look him up. Um, so he did a painting of a guy named, um, Coventry Patmore one time, with, he was an old fashioned um, British man with like wispy white hair, the long distinct nose and the mustache. And he said that the portrait painting that Sargent made of him looked so much more like him than any photograph he'd ever seen because everybody has had a bad photograph taken of them. And sometimes you're like, I look like that. <laughs> And when an artist is rendering a person, you can choose. Do you really want to exaggerate 
like you know the messy hair or the wrinkles or do you want to um do you want to show their expression that's him well you're quick <laughs> so he said um that he looked more like himself in this painting than he did um in any photograph he'd ever seen of him which is the highest compliment that i could think of to an artist right that's a great um example. it's such a cool story right Yep. So, um, so thank you for letting me take you on the tangent about portraits and my, my Oh, portrait. sure. Yeah. And, and then I studied portraits with my teacher, John Murray. Um, I don't uh, know how long, maybe well, four years. Portraits now? I have some portraits. I have some right here. Some that are even on the, the site. <laughs> God, yeah. Let's look at the real ones. Forget okay. about the website. Sure. But um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, my experience with portrait painting, I went to register for classes at SVA one semester, and it was close to the end of my degree. And I still didn't know how to draw exactly the way I wanted to. So this guy, Albert, that worked in the registration office said, this guy will make you or break you. And I said, I'll take it. And I went in and I wound up studying with John for years. He was just, he was so good. Even when he moved back to Arizona, he came back to New York and did two different one week workshops or maybe one was two weeks because he had this loyalty of people following him. And, um, and the way he taught was the French academic style where you don't learn everything in one class. You progress year after year. So the first day I show up to his class, I had my color palette and my paints and all this stuff because it was called portrait painting. And he said, if you really want to learn portraits and figures, you have to draw for a few years, just drawing. So in the class, there were people drawing and people painting and the paint looked really fun because I love color. But I said, all right. So from then on for three straight years, all I did in his class was draw. I drew on Monday nights in the portrait class. I drew Saturdays. The class was 10 to four on Saturdays and he wanted us to get there around nine or 9.15 to set up two platforms, two models. He was very popular, hundreds of <laughs> artists, you know, with all their supplies in there and a lunch break in between. And once in a while, he'd even stay and do a lecture after four for about half an hour. So that was like a full-time job those Saturdays and they were wonderful. It was awesome. Um, and then one day he came over to me and he looked at my picture and he said, your portraits don't look like aliens anymore. <laughs> and I said, thanks. And he patted me on the back and he said, do 5,000 more. Oh, and wow. I probably did. Cause I've done, I have, my studio is actually in the next room and there's so many pictures, but yeah, I'll show you a few of my yeah. portraits in real life here. And I think there's only one picture behind me that I did from a photo. Everything else I've done from real life, from observation. So, um, all right, so this is, this was a guy named Brad. Can you see it well enough? Yeah. Here, let me pull the computer a little closer. Wow, so this is done. And can any of my students guess what art media did Carrie use in this? Pencil okay. and pen. Andre, say that a little louder. Pencil. Anyone uh, agree or disagree with Andre? What do you think? So, Carrie, what did you use? Well, this is this is what white looks like, right? This is a toned paper, so it was pencil with white chalk highlights. But uh, there's actually there's only one little white chalk highlight um, on the nose and a little bit up here. But the white chalk highlights are more obvious on something like this. I'm going to turn this light off because it reflects too much. So if you could see, can you see the white chalk highlights here? Like, especially like on the necklace. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's that. Um, so we had like, I, I think I was doing portraits four days a week at this wow. point. Wow. You can see the white more here, especially that white shirt. Yep, this yeah. one. Can you hold that one back up again for, for another? So in this one, um, we definitely can see a lot more um, whites and darks. There's much more contrast. So the very first portrait you held up, I believe, was maybe just pencil and white charcoal. Yeah. And well, this one was, 
this would have been like a darker charcoal pencil instead of a graphite pencil. Gotcha. But really rich. And then this one here um, was with- um, They're beautiful. Oh, uh, thanks. The colored pastels, soft pastels. Wow, nice. He almost looks like Prince in between Prince and Jesus. A little bit. <laughs> he is, um, he's a musician that lived, I think he lived in Brooklyn. I lived in Brooklyn at the time. His name was Edwin Vasquez. Kerry, how but do I you- I remember all these people's names too, because they posed for us several times. How do you choose your people, Kerry? Well, at the time they had models that worked for um, different studios like this, um, SVA has models, Pratt has models, the Art Students League, and models also work for private artists. And there's just like a list. So like say Edwin came to our group um, three or four times, we'd say, Edwin, do you have any friends that you can recommend? Because sometimes models either are friends with other models or they um, pose together in a group picture. So they would recommend each other. And it's, it's kind of like actors and musicians, you know, it's like a, um, a close industry. What happens um, is when artists want to draw the human form, whether it's the face or the body, they will show up to um, they will show up to uh, life drawing classes and life drawing studios. Like there's one here on Long Island, and you pay I think it's twenty bucks, and you get to sit in the room, and, and a whole variety of artists will show up and kind of sit in a circle. And then in the center of the room, you have models that are posing and those models right. are paid. So, so most of the time um, artists, the, mo the model that they're drawing is whomever showed up that day. Um, but then of course you can also pay models privately and you can get to choose who you want to sit for you. Um, Carrie, how long did those models sit in those drawings that you showed us? Uh, so I did that either through the School of Visual Arts. And I also went to the Grand Central Academy for about a year and a half. So the models were chosen by the teachers there. And we also had a small group. Once my teacher retired to Arizona, we kept up our group. And it was usually three to four artists in one person's studio. And we'd all meet um, on Mondays and Saturdays. And we continued that. I mean, so I mean, how long did they sit like while you were drawing right. them? So, Oh. They would pose for 20 minutes and then it would be a five minute break, 20 minutes, five minute break. And that's pretty much a standard because after a while, like the model is either starting to lean or their legs start to get numb. And then if it's a longer pose, like the 10 to four pose, um, we would have a lunch break and maybe 45 minutes for lunch. Um, but there's some cool movies that show people posing like the girl with the pearl earring and Derek Jarman's Caravaggio. And, you know, it's interesting to see um, models posing. One of my models, who's a friend of mine still uh, named Sheila, was in a movie called Maze. Oh, cool. It was called Maze. So, uh, so she's posing for an artist there. And she always says, it's not really much of a story, but I did look her up one time, you know, to see that. And then here's one more. This is a, a big one, a self-portrait drawing. Mm -hmm. So I did this uh, last summer. Nice. So it's, and like, it's kind of like life size, maybe a little smaller than life size. That's about life size. Thank you. Um, so I have examples of a few other pictures. Um, like if you like portrait drawing, you, you can also go to the Met and the Metropolitan Museum. I drew that here last February, like a month before the pandemic started. Um, this actually might have been after one of those media meetings, Miss Brooks. Oh, okay. I, I think I had to do something that evening. So it might have been after that. So um, I went to that. Then I went to the Met and sat and drew this. You're allowed to draw at the Metropolitan with pencil, but not with ink and paint. So um, there's that. What else? Um, and then I, I do different media. Let me see. And I, I would also draw the same subject more than once if I felt like there was interesting things to do with that. So like this I did last summer also. These are these plants that I had in the back and- Can any of my students take a guess at what kind of art medium is Miss McKay used for this one? 
What do you guys think you're, what do you guys think you're looking at? Do you think that this is oil paint? Do you think it is markers? Do you think it's water? Can you see it though? I guess so. Yep. I think we can see close enough. Uh huh. Daniel, what do you think? Or Daniel, or let's see, maybe Clarissa. Clarissa, can you guess what kind of art media is used here? They're sleeping this morning. Yeah. I know. I have another um, oh, drawing of. Oh, wait, oh. hang on. Clarissa just unmuted her mic. Oh. That looks like watercolor. Yeah, it is watercolor. Very good. And then here's another version of. Thank those you, flowers. Oh, Different cool. style. And this was a little more like an illustration maybe you would have in a magazine or, you know, Clarissa, do you think that this one is also watercolor? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, but the style of the two drawings, that's pretty different, right? Yeah, they look completely, they, they don't look anything alike. Why yeah. don't they look alike? Because it's the way that they're being drawn. One is one is like drawn like, like it was drawn from uh from like real life. While the other one seems more like what she said would be like an illustration in like a, a magazine or something. Okay. So there's those two. Um, Can you talk to us about the two different styles that are represented there? Well, one, they're both kind of playful and, you know, it was just an experiment, me looking at something. And anytime I sit down to draw or paint, I like the challenge of really nailing it. Like I said, like I want it to look like what I'm looking at when I do realism, but I also love color and I love fluidity and being a little more expressive. So the second one with all the line drawings was more playful. And I, on purpose, sometimes I try to get myself to like, you know, not be so pressured to make it absolutely accurate. So playful, I mean like less, it re, if realism looks is very tight and exact, playful would be more abstract and less. Yeah, more. right. Oh, I forgot, I was gonna show you this one too. So this is an oil painting of um, one of the models. Oh, wow. So this was a girl named Nicole. So I'm looking at this one and I see that there is, you started with a background wash, right? You, you yeah. on, on yeah. this canvas, you made like a, 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 an orange brown. Yeah, this would have been burnt umber on here because the canvas color is white. And here's the back of the canvas. Okay. So some people think this is called the frame, but this, these are actually called the stretcher strips. The frame is what goes around it when you're finished. But the canvas is white. And then if you take, what, what I did here was it was burnt umber and maybe a little bit of orange or red in it also, and some uh, mineral spirits or a turpentine and you wash over it, then I'm not starting on solid white because solid white makes everything look darker. Even like looking, like even like my, the color of my jeans <laughs> right here. Um, this would look super dark against white, even though it's a light value. So when you do this, you can you can do this with gray. You could do this with like a, a light blue or a bluish green or a yellow. But once you take the white out, it's kind of making it a little easier to get the colors correct and the values. The values are very important. Like there's um, you know, there's a shadow right here. Yeah. And can you bring that one a little bit closer to the screen. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, there you go. That's beautiful. So like there's a shadow right here and you're going to notice it, but you don't want that shadow to be as dark as the cast shadow of the nose. And as you study portraiture, you're going to um, learn to look for that, you know, and, and you don't want to exaggerate. Same with like if there's like like a curve here a little bit, you don't want to make the cheeks stand out like a balloon. You definitely you want to get the curve here and the curve here. but you also have to realize it's almost straight the whole way down. It's like straight, straight, just with a little bit of curve. Now, did you sketch? I would have sketched this with um, the brush and with paint. It's I wouldn't have with sketched brush. it with um, pencil first. Yeah. And that was with the model there. Mm -hmm. so, um, so another thing I wanted to show you is like, I've worked very small. I think I might have done this when we were at Queens College. This is a little book. So mm -hmm. it wrapped up like this. And this is maybe an inch and a half by two and a half inches. 
it's a homemade little artist book and I decided to do a bunch of earrings that I own. So I'll oh, put cool. these along here. And I remember exactly how each one felt and who gave them to me. Oh, that's such a sweet little, I remember yeah. we, we made them, they're called accordion books. Yeah, yeah. we did that. That's you did, and did you do that at home or with your class? I, I, I had my students make that um, actually in the beginning of, I think it was this school year um, uh, when we were, uh, actually, let's see if one of my students can, can respond. Do, do you guys remember what, why did we make those accordion books in September? Andre? I know I can rely on you to answer. <laughs> Are you trying to get them to remember the the topic or the theme? Anything. <laughs> uh, keep all of our work work in like one place. Andre, when when I asked you guys to make the accordion books in September, or maybe I didn't do it for my seniors. Um, repeat what you said, though, Andre. We couldn't hear you. To keep all of our work like safe throughout most of the year. Right, that's definitely one one reason to keep all many works in one location. Um, I I I had I may not have done it this year with the seniors, maybe the younger grades. I did um, like an elements of art refresher. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll have to show you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, yes, we did that with my AP drawing class um, maybe two years ago, okay. and some people did like figure sketches on buses and subways. Some people did character designs, almost like anime or cartoons. Some people described the four seasons. You know, it's kind of an open-ended thing. You can do whatever you want. All right, um, what else did I wanna show? I wanted to show you a few things that I made while I was a graphic designer. And then, and this, <laughs> so I just showed you a very small picture. Here's so a, this is a big painting. Wow. So this one I think is on my website. Um, and I'll <laughs> walk it forward a little bit. This is one of the few pictures that I've made from a photo. Okay. So I didn't have my easel there and I wanted to do something large scale. So this one is beautiful. Um, it's hard to, is this oil? This is an oil painting. And I think it's like 40 by 40 or close or 36 by 36. So this is my son walking ahead of me when we were at a beach. And I, I really wanted to, um, you know, get that reflection. That was the whole point of it, but also just to have like the big airiness around it. You know, it, one of our students, Tasvia just wrote in the chat. It's so pretty. Oh, thank you. I agree with you, Tasvia. It's really beautiful. Yeah, I agree. That was, um, thank you so much. Yes, that is a large painting. This is also a large painting. This one's framed. Please and feel free to unmute your mics and and join yeah, in. Comment the whatever you want. Uh, so this is a painting. This I don't know if you saw this one. So this is a still life that I did with ten or eleven glass jars and one long silk scarf oh, cool. that was um, made in Belgium. I have, my stepmother's family is from Belgium, so some artists there that they know made this out of several different kinds of prints. And, uh, and I love, for this one, the challenge of painting something that looks like glass that you can see through, which is hard to do, but um, it's definitely possible. And to do fabric, you know, keeping the pattern looking like it's flowing and it's almost like a river coming down here. Folded fabric. And it's really a challenge and you did a great job there. Thanks. And, and to do a painting this big and, you know, make the whole composition interesting. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want to like be like, oh, wow, this part looks great. And then everything's boring around it. Mm -hmm. So you have to think, you know, like you can change your color tones around the background. This is negative space. All that's the positive space. So this balances that the color tone is kind of consistent and, you know, autumn like throughout the picture. But I have um, some portfolio pieces over here from when I was a graphic designer. I'm looking also at that still life painting in the background, I think it's fruit. That's so lovely. The yellow. That one, 
Yeah, I was just bringing a lot of pictures in here. So this one also has glass. This is recent. I don't know if I put this on the, um, the website. So there's two glass vases and a silk scarf with prints of sunflowers on it, but there's no actual flowers in it. And then um, two lemons and an apple and a couple of books. So I noticed that you, you stay, you have, a, you, you limit your palette. For, yeah, it's not going to be the whole rainbow usually um, because I want it all to look like it's in the same environment. Okay. Right? And one thing you want to do is like, even if you draw this kind of stuff, put something in the background, even if it's like a couple of quick lines or a smudge of tone, don't just leave something on a page isolated, you know? Okay, so there's that. Um, I have this portfolio case here. Where did I put that stuff? These are some of the designs that I used to do. Um, do you get hired to do portraits of people or maybe pets? I have, yeah. Um, so uh, I used to do shows and commissions and sales and stuff a lot. And then when I, I left um, graphic design 17 years ago and became a teacher. So this is my 10th year teaching. And I thought I was leaving graphic design, but I taught at a middle school for two years, like pretty much seventh and eighth grade drawing. And then when I was hired at Bayside, they wanted me for graphic design again. So you know, I thought I was done with that, but um, not necessarily. So um, I'll show you some of the things that I did in graphic design, but I had two boys. My boys are now 11 and 13 and that's the reason why I switched to teaching it's easier for our family so these are some things that I did in the job that I had where I worked um like four days a week it was a brochure about what to do with your millions of dollars <laughs> they, they had a lot of private investments so the writer would give me just the writing on um Microsoft Word and I had to make it look interesting so there's that these would have been mailers. So, and you wanna keep the designs consistent for the same company. So, you know, so if you don't know what to do with your millions of dollars, you can call Newberger Berman. I'm sure that, I'm sure that my students would wake up and-, and Yeah, it's, it's a big worry that keeps me up at night. And then this was like a quarterly newsletter. Cool. So right now designers are using InDesign, but 30 years ago or 20 years ago, um, we used to use a different um, program called Quark. Yeah, I started with Quark and then we switched to InDesign while I was at Newberger Berman and I love InDesign. I liked Quark, but, but I like InDesign even more. Um, this is from a different company. Right. Let me see the front of this. Do any of my students have any questions about um, Carrie's career path, like how she got two different bachelor degrees and how she worked as a graphic designer first and then became an art teacher? Um, anybody have any questions about her professional path. Yeah, unless you're in independently wealthy, you're going to need to make a living. And I chose to make a living as an artist somewhere in the arts. I didn't know where I would be doing it every year, but I knew I wanted to be in the arts somehow. Well, thank you for showing us all that stuff. Okay, so then um, what else is there? Sometimes I was able to, to use my illustrations like this. Um, I worked for an engineering firm and this was a proposal to work on a bridge reconstruction. I think this is the Thraklek. No, the, the Whitestone Bridge. You did the, the drawing as I well. I did the drawing and the, yeah, the layout. Um, and for that same company, uh, a lot of the photos that, that they had, this was construction manage management and engineering. A lot of their photos were not very good. So I came up with the system to blur most of it 
and just have a little bit in focus instead of focusing on bad pictures. And then, so this would have been a brochure just about that, the hospital work that they did. Okay. Like that. Um, That's an interesting um, solution to a... This was the, the cover of the main book. So here's blur in focus in the back. And then within here, there were, all, um, you know, I set up the top band right here and I established this template. Oh, it's a little and, hard to see that top band, but I saw. Oh, I think I'll get back to that. Oh no, that, it only appears in that one spot, but um, no, you want to use like consistent fonts and um, a color palette and things like that. So I designed that for them. What else? So and then you could even do this kind of thing. Like some projects were fun. This was Newberger Berman. They wanted to throw a party for investors in Michigan. So they had me design maybe a hundred of these. And it was a ticket that went in the, a specialized envelope that looked like a football for Michigan versus Michigan State. And they were throwing a party many years ago. Um, this is something I did for my wedding. Um, it's a whole package here. So it, um, as the, you know, like sometimes if you arrive at a church or temple or a wedding, they give you a program of what's going to happen. And I did a playbill. And part of it is that some people show up 20 minutes early and what are you gonna do? So I, I made the cast. Oh, that's adorable. And who's who in the cast. So we just had um, a maid of honor and a best man. We didn't do the full wedding party. And then I made the play, the actual ceremony. Oh my God, that's so super. And then I um, made fake ads for things that we like. And oh, I put nice. a real crossword puzzle together. And then I had this on the back. Aww. <laughs> and then... So the wedding, um, the invitation, because there's so many white, clean invitations and I've seen those over and over. So I did a painting for the cover of the invitation and it happened to be in April when the tulips come out. So that was the flowers that we had. Um, so I handmade these and printed them and cut them myself. Um, and then I, I had a big piece of watercolor paper and colored um, just those colors and made this as a thank you card, cut the tops of the tulips out, painted those, and then this was blank inside. And then for the bridal shower, this was the thank you card, the shower. <laughs> yeah. So, so we've like, only you know, if you have art skills, you can do a lot with them. A couple more minutes left. Um, what is your what is your parting advice for um, our high school students that are contemplating a career in the arts? Like, should I or shouldn't I? What do you, what okay. can you say to that? Um, well, the same thing happens with the students at Bayside. Some of them enjoy the art classes a lot, but they're not really willing to commit to the pressure of getting into the art field. So if you decide to go into art, be prepared for a lot of people competing for the same jobs or the same exhibits. Um, and you have to love it because if you don't love it, it's gonna always feel just like work and it's gonna be a big struggle. So you, you wanna know that you love it. And then also you wanna get better at anything that you wanna try. If you wanna do animations, do animations on Friday nights, do animations in between classes, like whenever you have a chance to work on that. If you wanna specialize in typography or photography, same thing. Also, if you see um, a posting for an internship or a competition, take advantage of that because you're gonna be building a resume and everybody's trying for, you know, like the few jobs that there are, the really good ones. And the more you put on your resume, the more experiences you have and the more people you meet and have in your network, the better your chances are for finding a good job and doing well. And um, you can't be lazy about it. You have to like really be aggressive about um, promoting yourself and you promote yourself through finding activity, finding opportunities. Um, because you can go and you can be a nurse, you can be an accountant, you can be a police officer. And those are pretty formulaic uh, career tracks. You apply to college, you do that 
um, four years, you take your exams and then you try to get into that field. With art, you really don't know where you're heading. So it's kind of a, a wandering path. And there, you know, you need to be actively pursuing opportunities even at your age. And um, you're probably not gonna make a living doing drawings and paintings. Like, I feel like I've got lots of talent and um, lots of training, education, experience and everything, and I can't do it. <laughs> You know, and just about everybody that I know who is an artist is doing something besides that one little craft um, to make their living. But, and, you know, it's possible that I could sell my paintings even for a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars a few times a year. I wouldn't sell one every week, but that doesn't come with health insurance. That isn't going to help me pay for rent or a mortgage. You know, it's, it's not really enough to live on. So you have to be willing to um, take a job and appreciate your time away from that job and you know, build your, your strengths, your education, your portfolio and all that stuff in your downtime. Yes. So, so it, are, have the students had any like people that really made a difference to them or inspired them or um, are there any opportunities they're thinking of doing in the summer? like? Like, what are you guys actually looking for? Do you, does anybody know exactly what they want to do? Because some of you may know and some of you might have no idea. I, I just did a survey with my seniors because we want to know who's going to art school and who's not. And, you know, part of it was, what is your major going to be? And some of them said IDK. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. That, you know, and that, that's totally normal. You might not know. Or you might go to school to be a you know, like a photographer, and then you switch to sports medicine. And there's nothing wrong with that. So Tasfia, you want to do fashion design? Hey, do you know the museum, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, Tasfia? Because, no? Okay, so you should look that up because they do teen programs um, every couple of weeks and they're free. You have to register ahead of time and you might want to visit them, but it's about design. So it's about um, jewelry design, fashion design, um, industrial design, all these different things. But that's a good place to look. And also the Museum of Art, um, yeah, Museum of Art and Design at Columbus Circle is called the Mad Museum. They also have um, teen programs and they have fashion. And then look into FIT, see if they have any open houses or things like that. We did, um, I did take my students actually to Cooper Hewitt. I think uh, two years ago when we were still um, doing field trips. Yeah, <laughs> so but they, I, I've seen that they're doing um, some afternoon programs. I think it's usually like maybe on a Thursday from four to six or something, but check those out. The Metropolitan has some also. And then there's the American Folk Museum is running some kind of summer program. Do you want to look? Do you want me to look that up? You know what I would love, actually, because we have to go. It's it's almost okay. ten thirty. But I would love for you to, um, if you have the time, um, to send me a, a links to all uh, of summer the, programs. Yeah, sure. summer programs that you recommend, and also um, who are your um, the artists that most influenced you? You did mention um, Sargent. John Singer Sargent um, is the first one that comes to mind. I studied with. Milton Glaser and Tony Palladino who, and Paul Davis. They were very inspiring. Um, they all had a good sense of humor and they were nice people. I don't like working with cranks. I don't like working with snobs. Um, they, were, they were nice, but they I were also that. like, they were witty. They were really intelligent. Um, another thing you could do, like just keep your brains going, do crossword puzzles or, or you know, play games, play chess or, um, things, you know, like stay off the video games. <laughs> Gaming, come on. I know, I know, but you know, let's be real. Yeah. We have that at my house too. But yeah. um, my, my younger son, who's 11, is destined for art school. He's doing, um, I don't know if anybody knows Flip a Clip. He does that on his I'm iPad. Doing a lesson in Flip a Clip okay. right now yeah. because of our he loves coffee, that. James J. Jack, he visited us. He's probably told Rowan about it. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, so my 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 digital art students were doing um, we're using Flip a Clip uh, cool. to animate. It's yep. so much easier than making a GIF inside Photoshop. Like. I know. Yeah. So yeah, Rowan does that. He does. Um, 
what is it called? Stop motion studio on his iPhone. Yes, we use and it so he, he has clay. It's mm -hmm. clay tunes, I think is the name of the clay that doesn't dry. So you can keep molding it. It's mm -hmm. and it's um, you know, it feels a little different from model magic. Model magic is drier. Yeah. Um, and then he does his own comic books that could be 30 or 40 pages long with dialogue characters. Amazing. Like he has this one series, Jerry B. Jones. He's on the fourth book. I have to introduce you to, um, I interviewed someone who teaches comic illustration at School of Visual Arts and- um, Who's that, do you know? Uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, he was one of my visiting artists and he, he now did, he started, um, he spearheaded the whole like uh, Comic-Con for a diversity convention. Oh wow, it's not Tom Motley, is it? It is not. Let me. Okay. Um, All right, you I'll can let me know later. You know, yeah, but I'll that connect well. with him, especially yeah. as a, as a graduate of SVA. Yeah. Uh, so listen. Was it Mears? Was it Mears? No. Mears. Uh, no. I should remember his name because I interviewed like, him. Well, Jonathan. like when. What'd you say, Debose? Jonathan, like his name is Jonathan Cohen, mm -hmm. and he goes by Mears. No, I can, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to find out. Okay. Like one um, thing that I tell my students is don't think that there's one way to do your art because there's so many different ways. Um, like I showed you, I have a traditional academic style, but I also enjoy doing illustrations and the graphic design paid the bills for many years. Um, so there's so many different avenues that you can take and styles that you can work in. Um, Dubose is on, Colin Dubose is on the line. He's another teacher in our school and he is got an amazing artist and has a really cool Instagram, which I'll have to share with you. Okay. Um, there's Jack. There's Jay Jack. Uh, <laughs> this, this guy, Ramon Gill. Ramon, okay, I don't know him. Um, yeah, he is a um, artist, writer, teacher. He teaches at uh, School of Visual Arts and he okay. started this um, diversity comic con uh -huh. um really really cool oh yeah. maybe it's fit and not school of visual arts okay um but regardless i will um i will connect the two of you and you can um yeah like rowan is going to be in seventh grade next year so he's kind of getting to the age where he could start the pre-college classes but it might be a little early now but he did two summers of art camp at queen's museum uh, you know, the one by Flushing Meadows Corona Park and loved that, came home with a shopping bag full of paper mache and paintings and drawings and all kinds of stuff. Um, that was a really good program. They didn't run it last year, but um, yeah. Also, um, Use Dan is a great art program in the summertime here on the I've heard of that one. I We yeah. haven't gone there. Yeah, definitely. That's close, yeah, that that's one. the North Shore. I don't know. I think it's like the middle. No. But but it's another good uh, art summer. It's a very good art summer. Program. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. Yeah, it was fun. Good to okay. see you. Thank I you. Okay, all right, so everybody have a good weekend and get your pencils and um, paints out. <laughs> Will do, I'll have to show you my work another yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, have you done this yourself? Uh, have I been a visiting artist? Yeah. I have not. Oh, well, maybe the students would like me to be the host one time on your zoom and you can be the visiting artist do you want to do that one day maybe <laughs> thank you for the offer i think appreciate it. it i think you should and i think you should hold her to it <laughs> they're all gone Put me on the spot <laughs> no. okay have a good weekend everybody have a great bye. weekend thank okay. you so much all right bye bye